Um, what I'm going to be talking about is, um, as Nick suggested, is my world. Um, it's a big survey that we've been running um, jointly, ODI have been running jointly with UNDP and the UN Millennium Campaign. And it very much speaks to the themes of this conference, big data, the open revolution and public engagement, particularly the latter. It's really a series of experiments in different kinds of public engagement in a very specific policy process. Um, and so I'm going to very briefly describe what it is um, and then to some of the kind of lessons and interesting things, questions that remain coming out of it that hopefully we'll also have a chance to discuss. So here it is, my world. Um, it is, um, like many uh, ideas, it's one that has come, it came out in a slightly random random fashion. Um, as many of you know, there's the big sort of political process and um, sort of furore among some sections of civil society, NGOs in the development sector, particularly around the question of what new set of global goals might be to replace the Millennium Development Goals when they expire in 2015. Um, and in the course of this, there was a big commitment really from the beginning within the UN system and elsewhere to make this a very open consultative process. At heart, clearly, it is a political process. It's about governments coming together and making an agreement. But the idea was, the aspiration at least, was that this was going to be informed by a much more open process of public engagement than perhaps had been the case in previous UN negotiations and certainly than was the case when the MDGs themselves came about at the end of the 90s. So there was a big infrastructure being set up around public consultation and some amazing things have happened around, you know, consultations in different countries, across different sectors, a whole sort of architecture was set up by the UN and has, you know, has been really quite innovative and exciting. But the trouble, the gap that my world exists to fill is slightly different. The problem was, this was a colleague and I, as many of the best ideas are, sitting around in a bar after a meeting um, in Tokyo in this case, um, talking about the process. This was a couple of years ago when these ideas were very much being developed. The problem was that it felt like the public engagement was very big and very broad, but there was no point at which the public engagement and the kind of consultations that were happening with the public was mirroring the actual political problem that politicians were going to have to solve. The task of creating new development goals is essentially a prioritization one. You know, we all know there are 101 very, very important things in the world, very important problems that should be fixed, very important aspirations that could make people's lives better. But it's really only sensible if you want the goals to have any kind of political impact at all to have goal to have sort of eight, 10, 12 goals. Essentially, it's an aggregation and a prioritization process. But there was no place in the consultations that reflected that. The consultations were very open, were very much about putting everything on the table, which is an important part, but we felt wasn't quite the whole story. So that's where my world came about. Um, it was an attempt to create a kind of consultation instrument that mirrored the political task that those governments that are involved in negotiating on the post-2015 agenda were being asked to do. The first thing, um, obviously, actually constructing the survey was a, a long and, at some points, to be honest, extremely tedious business, um, which I'm very happy to talk through the sort of steps of that in more detail, but let me save that in kept for the questions if anybody wants to, wants to know, you know some of the, the detail around that. The, the important point here really is that we set up very deliberately an infrastructure that had three parts to it. The first part is a website, and if we can just quickly go to the website now. Um, this is the thing for people in this room, if you've done the survey, this is probably how you've done it. It's on the website. You click, it goes through um, the 16 different choices, which represent, you know, obviously with the process of constructing the list of 16 options from which people are asked to choose the six that they would prioritize was in itself a very painstaking process over many months with many different organizations involved. But we, but we built a website, there are 16 options here of which people are asked to choose the six that are most important to themselves and their families. 
Um, you can see, scroll through, click. Every time you go onto the website, it, they come up in a different order. Obviously, there are all kinds of things like that that we were very um, sort of methodological issues that we were very aware of in constructing the survey. Um, and so far, something somewhere just over a third of people we've have done the survey um, this way. But if we can go back to the slide now, please. Um, the the other two ways in doing the survey in terms of um, volume and in terms of reach have been equally, if not more important. Um, just under half of the people that have done it have actually not come through the website, but have done it in a much more traditional survey type way with pen and paper. Um, you know, people going out to villages. Um, and that picture on the left there is the team of around 120 um, volunteers in Nepal just at the end of their training um, to conduct the survey. So they were spent a few days training and then they went out to the districts um, to conduct the survey in Nepal. And we've also been experimenting, and this is a whole interesting story in itself, with a whole number of different ways of asking, um, of asking the question on mobile phones. So in different countries we've been experimenting with different mobile phone platforms and different partners on that and come up with some, you know, the results themselves are always interesting and we've also been accumulating a kind of stock of knowledge about how one asks questions by mobile phones, which again, I'm going to try not to get into here, although it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so we built this, you know, we've been sort of creating over the last year and a bit, big infrastructure. Um, I think the first thing to say about it really is how excited people have been by the process. I mean, obviously, when we think about data, we think about the actual numbers that are collected, the kind of endpoint, the resource that you end up with to crunch and to think about what the information is telling you and so on. But the really exciting, one of the most exciting things about the experience of my world so far has been how the actual process of going out there and asking the questions has really kind of galvanized and inspired people. And this set of pictures is just, you know, a kind of slightly random collection of some of the different things that people have done. Some of them just completely off their own back. It's been a very sort of decentralized process um, of different NGOs, youth groups, others, um, just picking the survey up and doing different things with it. So that um, sort of funny um, picture on the top left there with the squiggles is a voting booth that was set up in Kazakhstan um, in a school, I believe where people were asked to sort of come along and do the votes in that very visual way. Then the woman um, below there is from Girl Hub in Rwanda, which is a Nike Foundation DFID initiative, where they trained um, a whole set of teenage girls to go out not just to do the interviews, but also to enter the data and to do some basic analysis of the numbers that they were getting back um, in Rwanda. And they reached, I don't know, 20,000 people, I think, asking those questions. Then across there, there's a, a volunteer from an Indian NGO asking, um, you can see, a, a, you know, going through the, the survey with a, um, a woman in the community that the NGO works with in India. And then um, on the top right there is my co-creator of, uh, of the survey, Paul Ladd from UNDP, um, presenting the results to Queen Rania of, Jor of Jordan and Gordon Brown at an exhibition that we held um, during the week of the UN General Assembly last year. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of inspired all kinds of people to just go off and do all sorts of things around the actual collection of the data has proved a really important sort of moment and vehicle for people to, to be creative and be innovative in, you know, in their own right, even before we get to the point of starting to talk about what we're finding which I think, you know, to be honest, in some ways was a slight surprise to us. I think we hadn't thought that the process of data collection was going to be quite so interesting. Um, where have we got to on the survey so far? We've got, um, in fact, I had a look this morning. I did this um, presentation a couple of days ago, and that's slightly out of date already. It's now 1.48 million votes, um, of which, as I said, just under half um, have come in through pen and paper, um, around just under a third uh, from um, mobile phones and the rest, oh, sorry, just under a third from the internet and the rest from the various different mobile phone platforms. Um, we've been working with Ipsos Mori, the opinion polling company, as our sort of methodological advisor on this. And clearly, you know, there have been all kinds of interesting issues that we can 
talk to would be very interesting to get people's sort of thoughts on around you know the the sort of line we've had to tread in terms of holding the question constant in order that the data can be aggregatable into a single database while at the same time clearly asking it across a number of different platforms um, and there's some very interesting issues that have come out there that I think have a bearing on the whole issue around uses of technology in data collection. We have um, 194 some votes from 194 countries, um, although obviously in some countries they're still quite low. Um, over 700 partners have, as I say, you know, sometimes kind of we haven't even known about it really till after the event, um, taken it, you know, taken it up done the survey with their constituencies, um, you know, fed the results into the, main, um, into the main database, and also we use it. I mean, the exciting thing about it as well is the, the way that the data has sort of two lives. So we, all of the data that is collected is fed into a central database where we also check for bugs and make sure that people aren't rigging the boats and things like that. But also people, are u some of the organisations that are collecting the data are using it you know, their own results with the communities that they work for as a kind of advocacy instrument and as a communication tool in its own right. So the data has a sort of both a, a local or a national life and a global life. Um, and the, the sort of simplicity of the instrument has allowed people to use it in all kinds of different ways in this very decentralised way. It doesn't need a huge amount of involvement from the central team because at heart it's an incredibly simple thing. We've also had um, some interesting partnerships with um, private sector that, again, has been one of the kind of interesting, you know, learning processes from all of us, for all of us as we've gone along um, in different ways. Clearly, you know, as I said, the Nike Foundation have been involved with Girl Hub in Rwanda. Coca-Cola were involved through sort of some stuff on their Facebook page and things. Procter & Gamble, particularly in Thailand, who were very involved in kind of, um, you know, the the Procter & Gamble subsidiary in Thailand were very involved with the survey there and pushing it out through their marketing networks and so on. And then clearly Viacom, MTV, Nickelodeon, and some other communications, um, more sort of communications companies have seen this as an interesting, again, I think because of the simplicity of it, as an interesting kind of tool to promote you know, something that they're interested in being associated with because it's very simple and quite a kind of powerful, um, powerful idea. And also, as I said, we've been able to experiment with all kinds of innovations in how we collect data, as well as the central, um, the central website, which has now been translated, I think, into, I can't remember, seven, ten languages. Um, we're also trying out different mobile phone platforms. Somebody made an app for uploading the paper. Again, this is one of these kind of things that just happened. Somebody in Indonesia was getting a bit fed up with the time it took to enter the, the data from each of the paper surveys into the central database and just made an app so that you can now just photograph the, um, each ballot and it gets uploaded straight into, the, um, straight into the system. And now other people in other countries are using that app as well. So it's kind of sparked off all kinds of you know, interesting, exciting little innovations um, all around the place. Um, obviously, the results, what's it actually telling us? 190, uh, 1.48 um, million people have voted. What have they said? Now, my apologies. Oh, this is, oh, it's come out. It's a nice big screen. It's come out reasonably, uh, reasonably legible. <laughs> um, what, a number of interesting things uh, have come out. Education has consistently been the top. I think almost from probably from about the first two or three hundred votes, education was at the top and it stayed there. And it's also stayed there. When people vote, we ask them for their, um, we ask for a sort of basic uh, minimal amount of demographic <coughs> data so that we can do some interesting analysis and really un try and understand what it's telling us. So as well as the country that they're voting from, we also ask people their gender, um, their level of education as the proxy for, you know, dividing people up into rough income groups and, um, and their age. What's interesting is how education remains top almost any way you cut the data. Um, education um, remains at or very close to the top. Similarly, healthcare very, very high. Job opportunities, not surprising. I think the biggest surprise for us early on, I've kind of got used to it now and stopped being surprised about it, but the um, early on 
a surprise was that an honest and responsive government um, was so high. You can see it's fourth now. It was actually third for a long time for the first sort of six to eight months of the survey. Um, and, you know, that, again, is a pretty consistent result. This is not just about, you know, people in those countries who we would think of as having bad governments voting for governance. People in, you know, most European countries and in the US are also voting for this um, option um, very high. Um, and again, you know, and then you can see, I mean, what that's telling us really from the point of view of the new, new um, UN Global Development Goals is that all the things that we were worrying about before, education, health, that are in the existing MDGs, we're quite right to continue worrying about. But there's uh, some new things as well that really probably should be in the next, um, in the next set of goals. Obviously, governance very high, perhaps a bigger focus on jobs, um, and some new things, crime and violence, and so on. Um, another interesting aspect to this is how the votes don't, at the very at the, the, the top four or five options don't jump around very much between um, between different demographic groups. It's when you get closer, to, it's when you get towards the bottom that you start to see some interesting um, jumps around between different demographic groups, votes in different countries. Um, I'm happy to, you know, we can we can talk through the results a bit more in the Q and A, but probably I should. It's possible to go on and on and on about all the interesting small stories that are coming out of the <laughs> that's coming out of these surveys. So I resist that temptation. Um, two, just two more things, really, about the use of the data. This is a picture um, of a hackathon that we um, did in New York City um, just before Christmas, where we pulled together a group of sort of data scientists and gave them some of the data um, and asked them to sort of work through. Um, what's in it. I think the challenge now, in fact, you know, as I say, there's been a huge amount of kind of excitement and interest generated in the process of collecting the data. And I think that's, the survey is going to remain open until 2015. And I think that has, you know, there's a lot of life in that yet, a lot of countries that are still, you know, coming up with new things, new innovations. They just launched in Sri Lanka, a youth group in Sri Lanka just launched a big drive a couple of weeks ago to get a million votes in Sri Lanka alone. Um, so there's a huge, you know, there's still a lot of energy left in the process. But obviously now we've got a big, you know, a high number in some countries. We've got, um, we've been doing representative, you know, properly sampled representative surveys in a growing number of countries. Plus, you know, we've got a sort of high volume now. Um, and the challenge now is to get people to start using this data. Um, well, I think this is brought home to me. <laughs> As I think somebody was saying in the session I was at just before lunch, that you know it's partly about assembling the information, putting it all out there. It's also about people using it. And we've now created this big resource, and we're sort of turning our attention to different ways of which this hackathon was really the first of telling people it's there, what it, trying to show people what it can do, what kinds of questions it can answer, how it can feed into existing or future research agendas. Um, and really encouraging people to make much more use of it. It's all open source. You can download the um, spreadsheet, um, an updated spreadsheet of all votes every, um, which is updated daily. So it's it's out there for people to use. Um, the, the lessons. This is my last slide. The lessons that um, that I've sort of taken away from this. Um, I think three really. Firstly, as I've said, one of the biggest in a sense, things that I've learned from this that perhaps we weren't really thinking of very hard when we went into this was the actual process of collecting data as a political process and a mobilizing tool in itself. So actually by creating this very simple instrument that people can immediately kind of understand what it is, get involved with it, use it in a very practical way, we've actually created a process for people to have a set of conversations about priorities, political objectives, resource priorities, processes, and so on, that people are finding very, very useful as a process and as a kind of mobilizing tool. Um, the second thing, clearly, is really the reason for which it was constructed, data as a political instrument. The original intention was for us to be able to come out with a set of data which said, OK, this is the priorities of these different groups of people. 
if you're going to construct a set of global development goals that is about answering the problems of people as they see them, then here you are. This is the things that they would prioritise. And I think you know, that is still remains very pertinent. We're doing regular reports into the political process. There's a whole political infrastructure being constructed by the UN around negotiating and agreeing these new goals. And you know, we're regularly feeding in um, to that political process. So the sort of political purpose of the data is, is very much alive. I think the interesting things that that has thrown up for us are three, really, is something of a not necessarily, well, there's something of a trade-off, really, between representativeness. Clearly, the first question that people often ask about the survey is whether it's representative, what steps we've taken to make it representative. As I said, we've got, you know, we're doing representative surveys in some countries. We're also experimenting with different weighting techniques to try to make the data, the non-representative data, more you know, through, through different sort of weighting techniques to see what it might look like if it were more representative of the population. Um, and that's an area where we're, you know, that particularly on the representative so surveys, that's an area where we're really, you know, keen to sort of push forward and, and do many more of those. But what's interesting is though the question is always first about representativeness, it's actually the scale which has really got people's attention. Everyone knew we were doing it and we were doing sort of regular feeding in, et cetera, et cetera, and representative and this and that. But it was the point at which we hit a million votes last September that was really when the whole thing exploded politically. Um, so what's interesting is that although questions people ask are about representative, the power of scale is also incredibly important in terms of the sort of political um, dynamics of this. And for us, at least, in terms of a small team with limited resources trying to make this happen, there's a certain trade-off between the two more expensive to do representative than it is to just go to scale. It's easier to draw, pull in sort of NGO partners and others who are interested in scale. It's much harder to find people to work with who have the, the sort of methodological capacity who can do representative. So there's a certain amount of trade-off between the two, and we've been trying to negotiate that. And then there's a speed issue. This is a fast-moving political process. It's all going to be wrapped up by September 2015. We have to have data which can be really used pretty much in real time. And when people, you know, when the negotiator from Brazil says to us, what are people voting for in Brazil? We can't say, oh, well, hang on, we're just analysing the results of the survey. We'll come back to you in six months. You know, we have to say, now, now, here you go. Here's a printout. So a lot of the sort of political power of this has come from the scale and from the speed, both of which to some extent trade off against the representativeness. And I think that's an interesting kind of thing that we're, you know, is a constant sort of issue in terms of where we put our resources and, and how we uh, move forward in different countries on the survey. <laughs> and then clearly as I, you know, the data as a resource, we've, you know, we put a lot of thought into sort of how we would put it out there, how we would get people to use it. We made it open source, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what, you know, again, I think another lesson for us is it takes more than simply putting the data set online and then sitting back to actually let people know it's there, get people to use it, you know, encourage um, people who haven't been involved with the survey so far to really um, make the best use of it, which is, after all, the point of it. But I think my final, you know, sort of the main thing that I feel has come out of this overall is simply and much more straightforwardly that it is possible to ask people for their opinions at scale you know and I can see Andrew from Gallup for sitting there this is no news to you but I think you know the world of development data has very much been to date around telling people how their lives are you know this is your income you have water you have food you have this kind of house it's been very much around, you know, we measure things that tell us how people's, what people's lives are like and then we tell them that things are getting better or worse. And I think the main thing for me about the My World experience and the link into post-2015 is that really that's not good enough anymore. It's entirely possible through old-fashioned face-to-face surveys and through all the new technologies that we have to ask people. And we have to move in development monitoring and in the new set of new generation of goals from a world in which we tell people that their lives are getting better 
to a world in which we ask them and make that the centrepiece of our monitoring. Thank you.